Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless our time together. Help us to come to know you better and to love you more. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and forever shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Can't hear you if you don't have your mics on. <laughs> hey, um, I, I, if any of you are doing the testing, there's two tests that you could have taken already, and and but that's your business. Uh, if you take them, fine. If you don't, fine. That's up to you and, and your parents. Um, I, I'm not going to bother with those things. I'm simply here to uh, continue to uh, go over lessons with you. And today, uh, I know Maria is making a new syllabus, but according to the old syllabus, today we're on day 13. Day 13, and it's the first chapter of Genesis. And there were a few questions. Uh, maybe we can run through these questions quickly if everybody turns on their mics and, and we can be like a class and I'll read the question and somebody will read the answer. Uh, don't read two answers in a row. Let somebody else jump in. So everybody turn on your mics and here we go. What's the first story in the Bible about? uh let's let's just do it you know just go ahead and answer jane creation creation we'll, we'll call this the rapid fire round you know we'll answer these things very quickly how did god create light he said so <laughs> he said so he said let there be light very good uh what did god call the dome the sky the sky. What did God call the dry land? Earth. Earth. What was God's opinion of all that he created? It was good. It was good. What did God command the fish and the birds to do? Multiply. Uh, be fertile and multiply. Good. In whose image was man made? God's image. God's image. What was man given dominion over? All living things. Do you, do you know what that word dominion means? Dominion means rule or control. Um, you know, sometimes they say everything in the Bible is true, but I, I don't know, Lucy. I don't know about that one, you know. It says we're given dominion over all the animals and the fish in the sea. You know, sometimes I've been fishing and I just fish and fish and fish and the fish don't bite. And, and, and I even say, I have dominion over you. Bite my hook. Uh, but they don't obey. I, I, I don't know if I have dominion over the fish or not. <laughs> I'm just being silly. I like to be silly. Um, what was God's opinion of all that he made? It was, it was good. very good. It was very good. You know, when he said that, he said that after he created a man, after he created a man and a woman. Before that, he said, it was good. It was good. Then after he created Adam and Eve, he said, it's very good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're the highest of God's creatures, and we're made in God's image, and we're very good. What did God do on the seventh day? He rested. Rest. He rested. All right. So there's the story of creation. And did anybody notice? Well, maybe you didn't notice yet. Uh, the second chapter of Genesis Um you can shut your microphones off now if you wish. Uh, the second chapter of Genesis is also a creation story. I don't know. Did anybody notice that? Yeah. Yeah. Let me grab my Bible here. Uh, 
I, I see a picture here of, of Ann. You know, I think that's why God said it was very good. I think he was thinking about Ann, wasn't he? Very good. But if we look at Genesis chapter 2, and you don't have to look at your Bible, but it would not be a bad idea to have a Bible handy sometimes, but I have mine here and I can read to you. And chapter 2, uh, verse 4, it says, such is the story of the heavens and the earth at their creation. At the time when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, while well, as yet there was no field, shrub on earth and no grass in the field uh, had sprouted for the Lord God had set no rain upon the earth. And it goes on to talk about creating things. So why do we have two creation stories? Did God create everything twice? No. But we have two stories of creation. Well, scholars tend to think that Moses started writing at chapter 2, verse 4. And then some centuries later, there were some writers, some Jewish writers, who wanted to emphasize the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath day rest. And so they wrote another story of creation, and they put it in uh, a six-day program, and then God rests on the seventh day. And then they would say to the Jewish people, look, God rested on the seventh day. You should rest on the seventh day. If, if you ever notice when you're reading the Gospels about Jesus, that one of the really, really big issues that the Pharisees are always bringing up is that Jesus is working on the Sabbath day. Jesus is curing people, and they're saying, ah, you're a bad guy, man. You're not, you're not following what Moses taught us. I mean, you're, you're working on the Sabbath day because curing that person, you know, they were so big on that. You, you guys can't imagine how big the Jewish people were on resting on the Sabbath day. They were not so, just totally not so about it. On, on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday for the Jewish people, the seventh day of the week, uh, they emphasized it so much. They, they wouldn't cook or they wouldn't clean. You had to do that on Friday. You had to cook all your food on Friday. They called that the preparation day. And, and so on Saturday, you didn't have to do any work. Uh, you, you, could not, you could not go on a journey. You couldn't go for a walk. That, and, and the Pharisees had it right down to how many steps you could take. And if you took one more step than that, you were on a journey, and that was work. And you were a sinner. And the distance was just a little less than a mile. Um, and, um, I mean, like who's counting their steps here? Well, the Pharisees are, they, they were that particular about it. They were not allowed to take medicine on the Sabbath day because the medicine would work. I'm telling you, they were crazed about it. And sometimes their enemies took advantage of it when they found out, oh, these people can't work on the Sabbath day. We'll attack them on the Sabbath day. And there are stories in the Old Testament where they, they just let themselves be slaughtered because they're not allowed to fight back on the Sabbath day. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. So. Well, the authors who wrote chapter one and emphasized the Sabbath day rest, they would never dream of replacing Moses' story of creation in chapter two with their story. 
So they left what Moses wrote intact, and they simply attached it to the front of the book. So they put their story of creation right before Moses' story of creation. That's why there's two creation stories. Everything is created in chapter one, and then everything is created again in chapter two. So there's a little explanation of why that occurred. And you say, well, can we trust chapter one? Of course we can. Because Jesus accepted chapter one as God's word, just like he accepted chapter two as God's word. God had inspired Moses to write the first five books of the Bible, and he must have inspired those authors later, we don't know who they were, to write chapter one, and they put it on the front of the book. Do you understand what I just said? Okay. So it's kind of interesting that there's two creation stories. In the first chapter, when man and woman are created, it's very simple. You know, God created man and woman. In God's image, he created them. It's like, that's it. In the second chapter, oh, we have a much different story. You know, God takes the, the dust, he takes the dust of the ground and he shapes it. And he blows the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. And Adam becomes a living being. And then he casts a deep sleep upon him. And while he's sleeping, he takes out one of his ribs and he builds up into the, the rib into a woman. You know, a much more poetic, you know, description of just saying, you know, oh, God made man, he made woman. You know, so chapter one, is, the description is quite different than chapter two. They are both true. They are both correct. There's nothing contradictory about them. Um, but they are stating it in a different fashion. So looking at our, what I call the spiritual lessons, if you have uh, the document there in front of you, on the top it says day 13, Genesis 1 and 2, textbook uh, 44 to 51. If, you're, if you have that textbook, uh, those would be the pages that you would read for further supplemental uh, knowledge. But these lessons come out of the brain of uh, Mr. Kudanya. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, God is the creator. He made everything from nothing. Now, I used to, with my high school class, on these notes, I would skip a few words. There would be fill-ins, and then students would have to pay attention, and they'd have to fill it in. Do you have fill-ins, or do you have them all, or is it all there? Yeah, Lena? Oh, there's a little hand on your screen, Lena. You accidentally hit the hand. Does anybody have fill-in notes or do you have completed notes? I just want to know what you have. At least in my pamphlet, uh, I don't have either. You don't have either? I don't. Our notes, we forgot to print them out. So we don't have them oh, I see. at all. <laughs> oh, my Way to go, losers. Yeah, Lena. As in notes, would you mean like, uh, like number one was what is sacred tradition? Number two is what is the Bible? Like that? Well, those, those were earlier. Now we're on day 13. Right. Okay. Then, yes, I do have these in front of me. Number 13 says, um, what is the canon of scripture? The answer is the list of books in the Bible is called the canon. No, you're, you're on number 13. I'm on, the, the lesson is called day 13. It's where we had those questions that you were supposed to answer as you read, as you read through your Bible. I don't know if we have mom sent them out. I don't know if mom sent the notes out for that. 
Oh. I, don't think do it. I, think uh, I don't know. You, you. Well, eventually, have... Maria's going to have to send all those documents out so you have all of those. I do have uh, the days in front of me. Day 13 says Genesis chapters 1 and 2, text page 44 to 51. Right. And then there's 10 questions, right? Uh, no, I just have the list of days. That's like the syllabus. Right. Mother is coming to the Hey, chair. Dad. Uh, yeah, we, I hadn't sent out the next set of stuff yet. We kept missing each other. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I was wondering what they had in front of them. All right. <laughs> they Obviously, do not have, yeah, they don't have anything from the Bible yet. Okay. Get on it, Maria. Get on it, girl. I know. I <laughs> okay you all you will you will get it eventually hopefully soon um and on this first uh this first lesson uh i have five points that i want to discuss one god is the creator that is a very big uh statement in our time um, I don't know how many of you realize that we're living in a society that is increasingly more secular and atheistic. Um, the word secular means of this world. Um, it's the opposite of religious. If we, if we went back 200 years, or if we went back 500 years, we would find society was extremely religious. People would have taken for granted that God created the world. There might have been a few philosophers who thought that the universe was eternal. There were some Greek philosophers who thought the universe was eternal. But most people on earth would have just assumed that this world didn't always exist and it had to come from somewhere. And since there's a creation, there must be a create creator. Okay. And whoever that creator, that would be their God or one of their gods for polytheistic peoples. And, but that's no longer the case. Uh, when you guys go out into the world, and when you go off to college, you're going to find so many uh, atheistic and secular teachers and professors and people who will literally mock you for believing in God and believing that God created everything. And they would say, oh, no, no, no. The, 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 the universe is eternal. It was always here. Or they'll give alternate explanations for how everything came to be, you know, uh, some sort of uh, evolutionary process or, or big bang explosion or whatever. I mean, uh, which uh, myself, I think is just ridiculous. Um, when, when did an explosion ever create things? Every time I see a bomb go off or a gas leak blows up a house, it doesn't create a new guest bedroom. It blows up the whole thing. It smashes it to smithereens. There's, you know, it's utter destruction. So how did everything in the universe get organized by an explosion, by a big bang? That's just, that just defies common sense. And, um, and I do have a college degree in biology, and, and, uh, and I predict to you, I will make a prophecy, a prediction to you, that before your life is over, everybody, most everybody on earth will have a very good laugh at the theory of evolution. It will be totally discredited. And, and people will say, how could they have ever believed such a stupid thing? Uh, the science of genetics is showing us every day the complexity of everything that's living 
as we learn more and more about DNA, we know that none of these things could be accidental because you have to have information. Uh, DNA contains an extremely large amount of information. And any time, in any place in our world where you have information, there's always an intelligence behind the information. And when you talk about living things, any living thing, the degree of information is off the chart. And to go from one thing to another thing takes information. If you don't have that information, you, you, can't, you can't get there. It, 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 the evolution say, well, it's a mutation, you know, and, but mutations don't add information. It's simply, usually it is uh, destructive of the information that's already there. It harms it. But it doesn't ever add new information. So to go from scales to feathers, you have to have new information. You can't do that with a mutation of your existing information. And to go from an amoeba or a protozoa to a turtle, you have to have a whole lot of information here that it's just not there. And Lena, you've been so patient. I wanted to finish that little discourse. So my question was, um... What exactly does the Catholic Church say about evolution? Like well, That's a wonderful question, and I'm glad you're leading the way, Lena. And I want all students, the whole idea of having a live Zoom class is that when something like that hits your brain, you can ask a question. And I love questions. I've been answering them for 40 years in the classroom. You can't believe some of the questions I've gotten. <laughs> I've gotten some real doozies. Uh, <laughs> what does the Catholic Church teach about evolution? Well, some of the things, the main thing right here at number one, the Catholic Church teaches that God is the creator of everything. And even things that aren't made of matter, like angels. Angels are pure spirit. They're not made of atoms and molecules. There was a moment, God is eternal. He always existed as spirit. So from all eternity, there was God, nothing else. And from that nothingness, nothing, no thing, from nothing, God creates angels and God creates the universe. And by the universe, we would define that as every material thing. Every atom in the entire universe was created by God from nothing. Now, this flies in the face of what you're taught maybe in the third or fourth grade in science class. Have you heard this? Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, but only change from one form to another. How many have ever heard that definition? And that is absolutely true. When you're speaking of human powers. When you're speaking of human power, that's true. We cannot create matter. And we cannot destroy matter. You do realize if I take a, 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 a wooden log, throw it in the campfire, and the log burns up, you say, well, I destroyed it. No, you didn't. You simply changed the organization of the atoms in that log. And you gave off a, a certain amount of energy in the form of heat and light, follow? 
You didn't actually destroy it. You know, it, it became ash, it became smoke, it, it was uh, dissipated in heat and light. And, and so uh, we cannot create matter and we cannot destroy matter. We can only rearrange the atoms. So that is a very big part of what the Catholic Church teaches about creation. Is that God created everything from nothing. In Latin, ex nihilo. Everything from nothing. No one else can do that. And then... And then it's interesting in the life of Jesus. We see Jesus creating matter. Can anybody tell me when? Jane? In the feeding of the 5,000. That's right. When he takes two, low, uh, two fish and five loaves of bread, and he makes enough bread to feed uh, 5,000 people, and there's uh, 12 baskets left over. So let's just say that the two, the two fish and the five loaves uh, weigh five pounds and you put it in one little basket. 5,000 people eat all they can eat. That's probably hundreds of pounds of food. And then they pick up 12 baskets left over. I don't know how big those baskets are, but let's just say each basket is five pounds. And then, so you get five times 12 at 60 pounds. So you started, you started with five pounds of matter and you end up with 60 pounds of matter left over and hundreds of pounds of matter eaten. That's not possible. We cannot create matter, but Jesus did. And that would be one of the clues that would lead us to believe, oh, this guy is God. Because God can do things that humans can't do. Okay? As far as, back to Lena's question about evolution, that's a huge question. Uh, the answer would take months. I'll give you the one or two minute version. The church teaches that the scripture is God's word. And in the literal sense, is what the author meant to tell us. And it's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, plain that Moses, when writing Genesis, he says that God created the various kinds of animals. Now, kinds would be um, similar to what we say in the in science class to uh, family, you, family, genus, and species. Have you ever heard this classifications? Um, you, you've got like cats, you know, but then you've got all kinds of cats. You've got big ones, little ones, you know, all, you know. You have family, genus, and species and getting more. Uh, you realize that you could take two dogs and you could breed hundreds of breeds of dogs from those original two. And that's what human beings have done. Um, so, it, but in Genesis, it says that God created the various kinds of animals. And so I wouldn't say that we have to say that God created every single species because we know that he didn't. We've, we have bred new species of dogs in just the last 50 years. You understand? Um, but God created dogs, you know, the, 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 the kind, that kind of animal. And, um, and Catholic theology has, has said that, you know, we believe in a creator God, and he created the various kinds of animals and plants, um, and he created them from nothing by a direct act of his will. And if you read all the various uh, 
fathers of the church, doctors of the church, they all agree on that. It's only in the last hundred years or so that you would find some theologians trying to dispute that because they have bought in to the theory of evolution. But the theory of evolution is, is I would maintain, quickly dying out. It's had its heyday. It started with, it started with Charles Darwin in, in uh, 1860. And, um, and it's, it's, I think, dying fairly quickly. Uh, give it another 50 or 100 years, and, and I, it'll be laughed at. Um, because the knowledge we have now is, you know, so far beyond Charles Darwin's knowledge, it's, it's not funny. Uh, if, if, uh, if Darwin thought a cell was uh, a mud hut, today we think that a cell is more complicated than a galaxy. Um, yes, Dodgson's. So you're basically saying that animals didn't go from like being bacteria to you don't believe in evolution. No, uh -huh. we, we didn't go from goo to you by way of the zoo. Uh, uh -huh. uh, bacteria to man, no. The biology Wait, so, and not, is like, not there. Humanoids to men, not like early chimpanzee versions of ourselves? Oh, I could talk about this for months and months and months. No, those so-called humanoids, most of the so-called fossils are complete fakes. Uh, they're, either, they're either animal bones or they're human bones and if you do the research, you'll find out that a lot of these people, uh, they get a lot of funding. And if they have a discovery or something, they get millions of dollars in funding. And so a lot of these people try to pass off as, as real stuff that is completely fake. And uh, uh, 70 years ago, we couldn't test it so well because we didn't have DNA testing 70 years ago. But as our DNA testing becomes more and more accurate and sophisticated, we can say, oh, that 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 really, you know, that's not that's not a real human bone. Humans have this DNA, chimpanzees have that. And they'll say, oh, well, I, they used to say, well, there's 98% crossover. Well, that's still millions of differences in genetics. Even if there is 98% the same, which we now know is not true, it's more like 92%. But uh, when, you, when you hear the scientists say that the genetics of a cabbage, you know what a cabbage is, and the genetics of, of a human being are about 87% uh, the same, <laughs> um, are we really closely related to a cabbage? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, these are, these are statements that, that people put out simply because you, you're, you're going to find out in life that people have a world view. People have a world view. And then they try to take the so-called facts of science and they try to fit it into their world view. So if you start off with a worldview that there is no God, then you have to come up with some sort of explanation for the universe and the world and the various types of plants and animals. You, you got to come up with some sort of explanation because it exists. And so you're going to come up with all kinds of things and, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the definition of the word science, which I, for next week, I should get that definition out and read it to you. Just look it up in a dictionary, the definition. I mean, you'll see something that is observable and repeatable. But you're not going to find anything like that in the theory of evolution. No one's ever observed it. 
because it, oh, it takes millions and millions and billions of years. So no one's ever observed it. Well, that's not scientific. And it needs to be repeatable. Like you do an experiment and you can repeat it, you know? Well, it's certainly not repeatable. Nobody's ever done it. You've never, you know, okay, let's evolve something in a laboratory. Well, you can't do it. And the origin of life is, is like, nobody's got a clue. And I, and I can take a cell, put it in a test tube. You know, we got a cell, uh, you name it, any kind of cell, plant or animal. Put it into a test tube, puncture it. Everything you need for life, the cell was living, a living cell. I got a living cell. Put it in a test tube. Just puncture the cell membrane. And all the goo goes out. Okay, make it come back alive again. Nobody has a clue how to do that. There are experiments that scientists, the Stanley Miller experiment, they've been doing it constantly since 1951, of trying to put various uh, chemicals and trying to start life, you know. And the most we've ever gotten done is, is, is a, a couple really, really primitive precursors of an amino acid. And it's not, nowhere even near living. But the thing is, you can give a scientist exactly what it takes for life, give them a living cell. Give, him, give them a hundred living cells. Puncture them and say, okay, make them come back to life. Can't do it. And so um, I've gotten off track here a little bit, but the Lena, you did it to me. Uh, it, it, it's a very long, long answer. And, and it is one of my favorite topics to read about. I have literally read dozens and dozens of books about the theory of evolution and intelligent design and the age of the earth and what happened to the dinosaurs. And all. I, I, I love reading about all that stuff. And there are extremely smart scientists from Yale and Cambridge and Oxford and, and smartest scientists in the world who, who laugh at the whole theory of evolution. There are other really, really smart scientists who totally believe in the theory of evolution. And, you know, um, anyway, I got to get off this topic because I would talk about it forever. Um, but the Catholic Church, well, I have, to, I have to answer your question even further. The Catholic Church does say this. Uh, Pope Pius XII in 1950 wrote an encyclical called Humane Generis. And in that encyclical, he stated that evolution was just a theory and that Catholics could discuss it. He said, you can talk about it. But it was just a theory. But what he said, you cannot believe. He only had a couple things he said that you cannot believe. He said that the Catholic Church believes that all human beings descended from one human pair. That's called monogenism. And he said, you may not believe that all human beings came from many human pairs. That's called polygenism. And so all human beings are descended from the first man and the first woman. We call the first man Adam. In Hebrew, Adam. It's simply the Hebrew word for man. And Eve is simply the Hebrew word for mother. So it's man and mother, the first man and the first woman. And from them are descended the entire human race. And that's what scripture tells us. That's what the church tells us. Pope Pius XII said that in his encyclical in 1950. And it's amazing that today, um, every biologist in the world would agree. 
that uh, when you trace uh, the mitochondria of the females on planet Earth, it is obvious that they all go back to one woman. And um, they call her uh, Mitochondria Eve. <laughs> In the scientific literature, they call her mitochondria Eve. I love it. And, and they also call, um, um, they have Y chromosome Adam, because you can trace the Y chromosome. Uh, let's see, females are XX and, and males are XY. And, and so uh, the mitochondria, you can, you can trace that back to Eve. And the why you can trace back to one man. And so even, even your secular scientists today agree that the human race is descended from one man and one woman. But Pope Pius XII said that in 1950, and the scriptures tell us that in Genesis. The next thing that Pope Pius XII said in Humanae Generis was that humans were directly created by God that God created directly the first man and the first woman. They could not have evolved from any other life form, ape, chimpanzee, you name it, cabbage. Um, they could not have evolved from any other life form. God created them directly. And the Pope said, the reason for that is, is that Adam and Eve have an immortal soul. No animal or plant has an immortal soul. And scripture tells us that, saying that man and woman were created in God's image. Well, God's image is a free will and a soul chiefly for us humans. The animals have a soul, but it's not an immortal soul. Uh, you probably don't know the word soul. Soul is another way of saying life. If something is living, it has a soul. So the cabbage has a soul. The dog has a soul. But they're not an immortal soul, a soul that lives forever. Only the human being has an immortal soul, and that's why we are in the image of God and we are the highest of God's creatures because we have this immortal soul that lives forever. And God is eternal and he lives forever. And so the soul is not made of matter. The soul is not made of matter. So it could not possibly evolve. Only something made of matter could change. But the immortal soul is spirit. It's not made of matter. So, there is, so the Pope stated very clearly that it is impossible for the first man and first woman to have evolved from a lower life form. Now, some people try to say, well, their bodies evolved. The bodies of Adam and Eve evolved, and then God simply placed into Adam and Eve an immortal soul. So you got an ape that gets an immortal soul, but that is rejected by the church. There's another theory that some people try to pass off. It's called theistic evolution. Theos is the Greek word for God. And theistic evolution would be that things changed over time from lower life forms to higher life forms. And it was God who was directing the whole process. But there is no college or school that teaches theistic evolution anywhere because the whole purpose of evolution is to cut God out. We don't believe in God. And the whole process is completely undirected. It is undirected natural selection. That's the whole 
point of the teaching of evolution. If, if, if one of these atheistic biologists would talk about theistic evolution, well, he'd be talking about the existence of God. And it would just be, oh, that God created everything this way. Well, it's still God creating everything. And that's the, that's the very thing that they don't want to believe in. And so there are some people who would try to push that theory of theistic evolution. And I guess in theory, it's possible that God could have done things that way, but it simply doesn't look that way when you study when you study the science of it. It doesn't look that way at all. Uh, it, as scripture says, God simply created the various types of plants and animals. He created the whole universe, and he created all the things on this earth, on this planet, directly from nothing. God can do that, and we see Jesus doing it. Jesus can change water into wine in an instant. God can do things, you know, that we humans can't even dream of doing. Paul? So um, this kind of leads me to ask, uh, do you believe in, shoot, what's it called? Is it spontaneous? I forget what the name is. Uh, like, what, what do you believe in the... Spontaneous like, generation? Uh, no. Well, no. So you had the dinosaurs, and, and then you had humans, which came after. So like, um, or species that came after. So did God just take this new species and put it down? Because you didn't have all species ever coexisting at the same time. You are making a very big assumption that the species did not all exist at the same time. I would completely disagree with your assumption. But that's a whole nother topic. A whole nother topic. Uh, we have to, uh, man, I am down to 10 minutes. We got to move on. I have four more points to make, which are, Lena, you did this to us all. Uh, but, it, but it's been fun. But it's been fun. Number two, time and space are part of God's creation. God transcends time and space. When God created the universe, that was the beginning of time. There was no such thing as time before God created things other than himself. Time is the measurement of change. And when all there was was God, there is no change. God, there is no change in God. There is only change in things of a material nature. Because the atoms can move, the atoms can be rearranged so that there is change. And when there is change, there is time. Space did not exist. Space is the distance between two objects. Even between two atoms, there is space. Even inside one atom, there is space, isn't there? You've got electrons whirling around and neutrons and protons. There's space. It's a tiny space. But there's space. So the definition of space is the distance between two objects. When no objects exist, there is no space. So time and space begin with creation. When we say that God transcends creation, when he trans, that word transcends, I don't know, don't know if you know it. God is beyond. He is outside. If I had a blackboard here, I would draw a circle and I would call that the universe. Everything, everything. And then I would put uh, a smiley face out here outside the circle and that's God. He's outside the universe. Now, if you were a Hindu, you would think that the universe is part of God. Everything is part of God. The plants, the animals, the people, we're all part of God. 
No, 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 no. God is distinct. God is transcendent. He creates the universe. But he doesn't create the universe out of part of himself. He creates the universe from nothing. Jane, your question. Would heaven be in the universe? Uh, heaven is a spiritual place, not made of matter. Okay? So that, it, it would be like the angels. Angels, would you say angels are part of the universe? I, I would not say that angels are part of the universe because angels are pure spirits. Okay? Um, philosophically, it gets difficult. Maybe some people would say the universe is everything that is. Well, but even that is hard, everything. Well, angels aren't things. It gets really hard. Uh, heaven is a, is a spiritual reality. And when I say uni universe, I usually just mean all the atoms and molecules that exist in all the, the planets and stars and galaxies, you know. Um, number three, creation is good. Matter and spirit are both positive goods that were created by God for good. When we look at that first chapter of Genesis, we see that God looked at everything he created and he said it was good. He looked at human beings and said it's very good. So that's a very important point creation is good down through the centuries there has been a heresy uh called dualism where matter is evil and spirit is good your body is evil and your soul is good there were heretics in the 13th in the 14th century uh the albigensians and and they taught that very much they said your soul is good but your body is bad. Matter is bad. Well, if you actually believe such a thing, what would you do? Kill yourself? Yep, and that's what they advocated committing suicide to free your good soul from your evil body. <laughs> Suicide's very wrong, guys. It's very wrong. But when you get your theology screwed up, you start to do really stupid things. Um, God shows us that matter is good. This is so important. Matter is good. Everything that God created is good. Our bodies are good. Our souls are good. Some people say, oh, well, you, alcohol is a terrible thing. Well, yes, you can misuse alcohol and you can get drunk and that's a bad thing. Or you can misuse food and stuff yourself till you vomit. That's, that's gluttony and that's a bad thing. But the food itself is not bad. The alcohol itself is not bad. Everything that God made is good. Everything is good. It can be used for good. Most anything can be used for bad. I mean, a baseball bat's good, but when I, you know, kill my neighbor with it, it becomes a, a murder weapon. That's bad. <laughs> um, it's not the bat that is evil. It's the guy swinging the bat, you know, that has murderous impulses in his heart. Um, Dodson's have a question. Well, there's a little hand on there. Oh, I'm on a Chromebook, so I don't have the hand feature. I don't know how that. Oh, sorry. I can't, I like, I can't raise my hand or anything. <laughs> okay. Um, so very important point, and we'll hit it really hard in the next lesson. Everything is good. Everything that God made is good. Matter is good. Number four, Genesis is a religion, religious book. It's meant to teach religious truths. 
Right. We always have to know what kind of literature are we reading. And the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, are religion books. They're teaching us religious truths. And, and sometimes people take the Bible and they want to get all kinds of other knowledge from it. But it's not really written for the other types of knowledge. It's written to teach us uh, the truth about God and our relationship to God. And the main truth from chapter one, the main truth is that God is our creator. And he's a creator God. He's a God of life. He's a God of love. He is a God um, that is good. And he only creates good. Well, the obvious question that should pop into your mind is what? When I say God is good and everything he created is good, what's the question that should pop into your mind? What? Why are there, why do bad things exist? Sorry, I was on There you go, Lucy. Where did evil come from? If God created everything and everything he created is good and God is good, where the heck did evil come from? And you probably know the answer very quickly. We're running out of time. What's the answer? Absence of God. No. Satan. Well, Rejection Satan. of God. Where did Satan come from then? Pride, rejection of God, rebellion. Well, you're 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 on the right track, but it's it's the first evil was when angels took their good free will and they used it wrongly. The angel was good, the free will was good, but they used it in the wrong way. It's kind of like me with my baseball bat. I'm good, my bat's good. But if I use it wrongly, there we got some evil, don't we? And so we, angels and humans, we brought evil into the world. Not God. God is perfectly good. His will is perfectly good. And his creation is perfectly good. Uh, I've got one minute left. Man was made in the image and likeness of God. Well, there's a lot of things can be said about that, but I'm going to give you the two main ways that we are made in God's image. One, we have a free will. We can choose between good and evil. We have an intellect. We have a brain that can tell between good and evil. And then we have a will that can choose it. I can choose to do the right thing. I can choose to do the wrong thing. The dog can't do that. The, the, the apple tree can't do that. The plants and the animals, they don't have intellects and they don't have a free will. The second thing is we have an immortal soul. The spirit that God put inside human beings lives forever. You are going to live forever. Every one of you and me, we are all going to live forever. You cannot kill yourself. You can kill your body, but you cannot kill your soul. Jesus will talk about that in the New Testament. He tells people, do not fear those who can kill your body and do no more. He said, I'll tell you who to fear. He says, fear God, who after killing your body can cast your soul into hell. You see, the soul goes on living. Somebody murders you, they only kill your body. They cannot kill your soul. Your soul is eternal. It, it lives forever. God lives forever. So in that way, you are in the image of God. You are like God. You, you are immortal, and you can choose between good and evil. Okay? So those are the two chief ways that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. There are others, but... We'll, we'll stick with those for today. Well, that got us through 
Genesis 1, when, when you do get your packet, when Maria does send them out, you'll, you'll see those questions. The next is called day 14, and there's 15 questions, and you'll want to read Genesis chapter 2. Uh, and we're going, I'm going to spend uh, at least two lectures on Genesis chapter 2. There's a lot for me to explain. I hope Maria gets the notes out there to you. Uh, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Lord, for creating us in your image and likeness. Help us every day with your spirit to walk in faith and in holiness and to bring your love to this world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. It's wonderful being with you. Uh, God bless you all. Have a nice weekend. I hope to see you next Tuesday.